Chat with Traders, episode 130. This is your key to the minds of trading's elite performers, those who profit in relentless markets. Here on the Chat with Traders podcast, you'll hear about the skill sets and tactics that lead winning traders to win so you can level up and become a better trader. Here's your host, Aaron Fifield. What's going on, folks? Your host, Aaron Firefield here. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate your company, as always. Now, in a big way, in a very genuine way, I am really excited. <laughs> I am really excited to be sharing this episode with you. I promise you are in for a real treat, all right? This week's guest is a trader of a different kind, though. He doesn't trade stocks and bonds. He trades in real estate. You could probably call him a property developer, although he doesn't build from scratch. What he does is he buys distressed apartment buildings, hotels, and shopping centers, etc., fixes them up, and then sells them to make a profit. His name is Ben Mallar. He grew up in one of the roughest areas of New York and had a very tough upbringing, but Ben is the true definition of a rags to riches story. During his early 20s, as a side hustle while working in the military, Ben began getting into real estate. 30 years have since passed, and in that time, he's built up a real estate empire worth approximately $200 million. I first discovered Ben from a YouTube series called Life for Sale, and pretty much straight away, I knew it would be badass to get Ben on the podcast. Essentially, the series follows Ben around showing his day-to-day -day life. It's very cool. I encourage you to check it out. You'll probably watch the first episode and then just binge watch the rest because it's that good. So what I've done just for your convenience is I've set up a link so you can easily find it. So chatwithtraders.com slash Ben, B-E-N, that will actually redirect you to Life for Sale on YouTube. Now, just to save any confusion, during this episode, you'll hear Ben yelling at and referencing someone named Danny at several points. Uh, Danny's the one who's been filming and producing the series, and he actually helped me to set this up, uh, just to, like I said, save any confusion. So I won't say any more than this, just listen and enjoy the episode. Ben's got a lot of personality and inspiring story, and he's a very honest character. Boys and girls, here is Ben Mallar. So, Ben, I want to ask you, like, straight up, how did you get into doing this show, Life for Sale? Like, I absolutely love it. Whose idea was it? Was it yours or did Danny come at you with this? Um, I don't know. I just, uh, we got kind of got caught up with it with a celebrity trying to put something together. And then I think Danny basically um, came up to let's do our own show. Or, oh, no, what happened was I was pitching the celebrity show to producers and they said, forget about that. You should do your own show because they saw how I carry on and, you know, and with, with, with my the people I work with and, and all that stuff. So, um, I don't know. And Danny is the guy that uh, started pretty much the whole thing is um, he just pretty, pretty much took the ball and ran with it. Danny's the mastermind behind it. He's an mine. <laughs> Take off the M. Danny's a pain in the ass, basically. <laughs> You don't know the whole story behind him. That's the thing. He's like, you ever, there was an American TV show called Dennis the Menace. And it was about this little kid, which he looks just like, that lived next door. And all he did was cause trouble in the neighborhood. And that's what Danny does. He's like the Dennis the Menace of the neighborhood. Right. Well, I think everyone around the world is, is familiar with Dennis the Menace. I mean, it's a childhood classic. Um, now, the promo video for Life for Sale, the, the very first video that came out, you said something along the lines that you wanted to find someone to fill your shoes who would buy you out for like 50%. What's the deal? Is that is that really what you're trying to do here? You know, ever since I got into real estate or even ever since I was a kid, everything is for sale. That's what I learned at a very young age and always practiced that. Everything has a price. And if somebody's willing to take that price and you make a profit, take the money and run. Okay, and that's the 
basically everybody has their own uh, rules to go by in life. Um, my rule was that always worked best for me. Take the money and run. If you got something worth money and you can make a profit on it, take the money and run and be happy you made money because a lot of people don't. I can't wear these earphones no more. I'm sorry. I, it's making me feel like I'm, I don't know, I can't handle it. Keep it on for now. Uh, it's, uh, can't I just go back to where we were? <laughs> don't say no. Try it. It was working fine before you put these earphones on. <laughs> you can hear me, right? Please. I don't want to wear shit. You have to. You know, why can't you do it the way it was? It was fine. It's, it's the echo from him, not me. I know it comes back in your ears. Stop. Hello? All right. Yeah. Hello? All right. All right. I'm, now he's giving me the other. Well, he gives me these big... It, well, the, shit. The first thing he does is give me these stupid earphones, the big headphones, and then everything's muffled, and now he gives me these two little stupid ear things to stick in your ear. My ears don't fit these type of plugs. All right. I don't know. Let's see. There we go. Can you Just hear me do, now? It, do what works best All right, for you. That's good. Yeah. All right, very good. There we go. That's better. That's better. He gives me the, the, the shitty stuff first and then holds back on the cheap stuff. I mean, uh, holds back on the good stuff. He's a pain in the ass. <laughs> good thing he's living with you then. <laughs> hey, seriously, do me a favor. Let, let me send him to fucking Australia. All right? Just I've seen that video where the kangaroo punched somebody in the face. All right? That was really <laughs> cool. Did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. Did you see that video I'm talking about? Well, you see it all the time. You probably got, have you ever got punched in the face by a kangaroo? No, that, I mean. <laughs> You've never been in a fight with a kangaroo? Kangaroos that size are in the outback. All right. You never went to outback? We got outbacks everywhere. They got really good steaks. You know, we, when an American guy copied the name outback, I know the guy that started it. He copied, he took the name Outback and opened up a bunch of restaurants in America and everybody thinks it has an Australian name, but it's really an American guy sitting over here in Clearwater, Florida that created it. Yeah, there is none of those restaurants here in Australia. I don't think he's not Australian. No, it's not. Not at all. All right. So, I'm sorry. You were saying we started... Uh... All right. So, let's just keep going. So, Ben, I want to take this back to you growing up and I want to hear a bit about your backstory. I know like that's where it all started for you and kind of shaped you into the sort of person and made you what you've become today, essentially. You grew up in one of the roughest areas of New York. Tell us a bit about what that was like. I mean, you know, it's very tough when you're, you know, when you're surrounded by, you know, tough ass people. I mean, you know, especially being the only white kid in the whole neighborhood, you know, I didn't live in the really good part of town. I lived in the, uh, in, in, in the, where the projects were. And, uh, I mean, it was extremely dangerous. And it just kind of grows. You, you, you know, you just, you become numb to it. You know, you just, you know, it's the life is a, especially when you're a child, it's so easily to just adapt. You have no choice but to adapt. So basically, you know, <coughs> excuse me, you grow up learning, you know, that, uh, you live basically in a cesspool and you got to fucking survive somehow. And, uh, that's basically, you know, what my childhood was like. Um, you know, and I came from a very dysfunctional family and, uh, it was a fucking disaster. You know, I wouldn't wish it on any kid. So, like you said that you came from a dysfunctional family. And I know, you know, life at home was certainly far from ideal. Was there anyone who, in a way, almost raised you or was very influential to you in some way while growing up? You know, I pick off little parts of different people. You know, I'll pick out the part of a person that I feel benefits me, you know, um, and leave the bad shit alone. I only pick out the part I need. So there's been a lot of people. I mean, I, I, I was raised, uh, there were parts of my teenage years I lived in Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan, and you walk out of your door at 300 West 49th Street on the corner of 8th Avenue when I was a kid in the early 80s, very late 70s, and the pimps were on the corner, the hookers were on the corner, the drug dealers were on the corner, the con men were on the corner. Uh, I knew everybody. I was, you know, I don't know. I always blended into everybody. And, and even for the worst criminals in the world, you know, you learn street smarts, you know, and then, you know, I learned stuff from educated people and I've learned from, you know, a lot of people. I try to pick out from everybody. If I, if I feel you're somebody I can learn from, I'm going to definitely, you know, take advantage of it. And being surrounded by these sorts of, I guess you could call them sketchy characters, you know, pimps, drug dealers, etc. Did you ever get caught up in that world? You know, I was very young and I was around it, 
but I never got to, you know, I, I learned how to just have my own place without being in their world. Luckily, I was very young anyway. Um, you know, but, it, you know, I was always the one to hang out with old, older people. And uh, I was always it's very strange because I was only the only little white kid around. So it's like I was kind of always accepted, too. <laughs> I don't know. It's very strange growing up in New York. It's, it's a strange place. But, um, you know, I always got along with whoever was around me. And uh, the type of person that definitely believes in networking and getting along with people and, you know, and surviving. So, you know, uh, but I would I would never cross a line. When things got very ugly, I, I, I was really lucky and at the age of 17. <laughs> Um, I went to court because I got in some trouble, and um, I stood in front of the judge, and, um, you know, uh, it wasn't the first time the judge saw me, <laughs> and he says, so, okay, big shot, what are you going to do? Well, I had the recruiter on my right, and I had the bailiff guy on my left, so I saluted the judge, I turned to the recruiter, and I said, let's go. So the Army pretty much saved my life and got me out of New York and got me a lot of discipline and taught me how to... Uh, you know, get the job done, no matter what. Uh, well, when you got the whole army backing you up, it ain't that hard either. I mean, but you learn about putting people together, making shit happen, and working with people. And uh, so really, you know, I will say that, you know, and sent me all over the world and uh, definitely was my uh, most important influence in my life uh, was the military. I spent about five years in the U.S. Army and three of them in Germany. Uh, okay. I had no idea you were in the military. That's really interesting. Yeah, it saved my life. That was the that was the first thing in my life that was positive, that actually you know helped me a lot and 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 just put me in a new surrounding and and taught me how to run things and organize things and you know and and gave me a lot of really good skills and took all the street crap out of me and you know gave me uh put me on the right track for a right life. And what was your role in the military like? What did you do? I had a desk job. <laughs> I, I, I had to be in the army because what happened was uh, I screwed the test up the first time I took it because I was out partying the night before. I was about I just turned seventeen. Then uh, he told me, "Listen, if you score better on this test, you're going to get a better job." Because I told him, "Listen, I don't want to be any. I'm not. I don't like crawling in dirt. I'm not one of those GI Joe guys. I want to be around where the women are at in the army. Uh, you know, I'm not real gung ho. So." Uh, he said, well, then you better study for this test and take it again. Well, I studied for the test. I took it again. I scored really high, and I got a great job when computers were just not even heard of. We were using computers in the Army and data processing and traffic. I was a traffic management coordinator, moving materials and anything, tanks, everything across the world from a boat, plane, train, you name it, we moved it. Uh, so it was very good. A lot of training, and uh, I always had a nice desk job, computer work. I worked with a lot of women, and um, it was very pleasurable, <laughs> and um, it was great. Okay, so how long were you in the military for? Was it about seven, eight years? No, no. I, I signed up for four, and I extended one more year to five. So from 17 to 22, I was in the Army. Okay, so you were 22. You've come out of the military. What did you do? Obviously, real estate is your thing now, and you've been doing that for a long time, but what did you first try your hand at? Honestly, I always liked real estate. I had some basic knowledge when I was a kid, uh, when I was, uh, you know, growing up, uh, but, but, but it was untouchable for me pretty much as a kid in New York. There was no opportunity. Um, you know, we all can't be Donald Trump's. Um, so in the army, I actually was hustling apartments. I met this guy. I needed apartments and there was no room on base to live. So they give you money to live off base. And uh, I needed an apartment, so I met this uh, guy. He said, hey, go see this guy. Everybody knew to go see this guy, uh, Italian guy. He spoke German. He'll find you an apartment with the Germans, and uh, and you pay him a few bucks, you know, a few hundred bucks a day, whatever it was. So I met this guy, and we kind of got along. You know, I like meeting people. And uh, we got along. We hit it off. And I said, hey, if I start bringing you more business and more GIs, uh, you know, will you give me a nice, you know, uh, uh, referral fee? You know, and he said, sure. So I started hustling, be everybody on base. I started, you know, taking over and, you know, telling everybody, hey, you need a place, you know, just call me. And uh, so, you know, I made a few bucks hustling in Germany, um, renting apartments out to GIs. And then um, then they sent me to California and um, San Francisco area 
which I couldn't afford. So luckily they sent me to Oakland, but then that wasn't, well, I was lucky in one way, unlucky in another. Oakland's a very rough town. Um, they sent me to Oakland and I rented an apartment in a building full of Navy guys because I had a job at the airport. I'd run the flights out of the airport in Oakland that would go to Hong Kong, um, not Hong Kong, Japan, uh, Philippines. We had special planes that we used, uh, at the airport to ship military overseas back and forth. So I, I, I handled the planes, uh, coordinating all that stuff with the Army, Air Force, Navy, all of them. So anyway, make a long story short, I lived in a building with a bunch of Navy guys where they lived. And, uh, I met, uh, I started helping out the landlord there. It was an old lady, uh, picking up garbage for a couple of hundred bucks off my rent every month. And, um, that's the story. The Army sent me there, and then I started picking up garbage uh, in an apartment building for 200 bucks a month. That's got my start in real estate. Okay. And so, how old were you when you actually bought your first real estate? So, here you've, you've kind of described as you were doing a lot of like referral fees, getting uh, tenants in vacant properties. But when did you actually buy your first real estate, like do your first deal? On my own? Yeah. I used my, um, let's see, did I use my VA loan or not? I might have used my VA loan. No, that was to buy a house. That really wasn't a big money maker. My first real estate deal to make money was like a crack house that nobody in the whole place, uh, the whole town wanted. Uh, people were actually in this smoking crack when I bought the place. Uh, it was a foreclosure. Nobody wanted it. It was really cheap. It was like 26000 It ended up turning into be like, a, it was a, uh, you know, when I got done with it, it was a big duplex. So it was two big apartments. Um, you know, I scraped up, uh, whatever, you know, whatever you needed to put down, you needed back then, maybe even was 20% down, 20% was, you know, uh, times 26,000 is only like five grand. And then I fixed it up and I rented each apartment out in a duplex for probably 1200 a month each. So I took a piece of shit that nobody wanted, uh, Bought of a twenty six five or something, probably you know, and only used like a few bucks to buy, use the bank's money, and fixed it up for about probably another ten grand. And uh, let's see, I'm into it for about thirty six five, say forty grand. And uh, I rented out as two apartments worth twelve hundred dollars a piece, so that was twenty four hundred dollars worth of income. Now the place gets appraised out based on its income. So if you take the twenty four hundred dollars a month times twelve is what twenty six eight or something. Uh, now the place is now worth about seven or eight times the gross. So say seven times twenty six, it's worth about one hundred fifty grand. So there you go. I made a uh, hundred grand basically, you know, on a piece of shit that nobody else wanted. They used to call me garbage to gold when I was young. All the big shot landlords. All the other guys that had property that were in the game, you know, because I was out there really getting my hands dirty and I would I would take the worst of the worst and, and turn it into something positive. Because, you know, we had, we, we were lucky also, you know, we had what we call Section 8. So I could always, if I fixed the place up nice enough, I could always find a big family that had government assistance and the government paid most of the rent. In most cases, the government paid all the rent because the tenant had to pay their own utilities. So if they were a low-income tenant, they only had enough money to pay the utilities. They had no rent. And the government paid me the whole 1200 every month, guaranteed. So it was very safe, too. You just have to make sure you don't rent to murderers or, you know, bad people. Now, just backtracking a little bit, you said when you first bought this property, there were actual crackheads still in the place when you bought it. Yeah, I remember having to go get some friends to come with me to, to throw them out. Because, uh, I don't know, the police... Eh, the police are so fucking busy, they didn't have time for that shit. <laughs> so, uh, I remember there was some crackheads in there. I, I actually think we might have, I don't know, we might have gave them some money and said, here, go buy some crack, just don't ever come back. And that was the end of it. It was nothing physical or violent. Okay. Good negotiating tactic there. Yeah, I mean, I mean let me tell you something. I, I grew up around killers, murderers. I mean, you know, I grew up around people like that. But I, I, don't, I don't like violence, you know. I, I just felt like... The human being should be far past or evolved past violence. I mean, you know, whatever you want, whatever I want, you make a fucking deal, you, you know, and you find a mutual grounds and everybody lives happily ever after. You know, instead of all that aggressive feelings, hating people and wanting to hurt them. Except Danny. 
I want to kill Danny. <laughs> I've been trying to talk him into suicide, but he won't fucking do it. Oh, wow. Here we go. <laughs> you don't know. He makes my life miserable. But anyway, so that's the story there. I bought my first place, a uh, piece of shit in the neighborhood because uh, I had no money. I had nothing. And luckily, our mortgage broker started, you know, people, the problem thing was this. I was heavy into the property management. You know, I was making money hustling apartments like I did for that guy in Germany. I started doing for Section 8 landlords. I was, you know, hustling, telling landlords, listen, you give me the place, I'll rent it out, I'll charge you 300 bucks, and you ain't got to deal with it. So, you know, I started really as a leasing agent. Uh, and then, then you got to, you know, where, of course, when you, what people don't realize is that if you really want to be successful, you start out providing the service, but then eventually, you know, you become, you know, an owner. You have to have that goal not to stay a real estate agent or not to stay a leasing agent, which is great for some people. I know brokers that make, you know, million dollar commissions, but, um, you know, I always wanted to be an owner, own real estate. It's a nice, simple business. You know, you give somebody a place to live, they pay the friggin' rent, uh, you pay all your bills, and whatever's left over is yours. And if you know what the hell you're doing, uh, and you don't take a, you know, you don't take a lot of risk, then, um, it's pretty simple. It's, it's probably one of the, next to prostitution, it's gotta be the oldest, uh, profession in the, in the, in the world, I think. Yeah, I mean, it probably is. Probably is. Prostitution legal and is prostitution legal in um, Australia? Uh, no, I mean there are brothels here, but I don't so think they prostitution actually have it is legally, legal. Huh? No, but they have brothels. Yes, they do yes. it. They do it in a classy way. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this first place you, you fixed up a lot yourself. Is this something you continue to do? Was fixing up places yourself? I mean, I know these days you obviously have contractors and people who you hire to do the work for you i hired bums off the street when i had no money i'd hire guys that would stand in front of home depot looking for work mostly it was you know a lot of times it was you know mexicans that you know in their papers they go in front of home depot you got home depot out there what do you got in australia what do you got can you, uh you got so we've uh we have bunnings which <laughs> i know you've probably never heard of <laughs> have you ever heard of home depot yeah, of course, of course. Oh, okay, yeah, you go. Oh, you're in stocks. You should exactly. Imagine if we bought Home Depot. Imagine if we bought anything back when the fucking market crashed. But then, I mean, you can always say that. I mean, you know, things are going to come back. I mean, and it's, what's sad about it is I spend multi millions of dollars a year in Home Depot, and I don't even fucking buy the stock. That's that's just stupid of me. Okay, so this was your first step. Now, obviously, we're not going to go through each and every deal you've done because we'd be here for days, but. What was your second deal? I just want to like kind of get a bit of a perspective on how you kind of took the next step up and begun to build a bit of momentum. So what was your second deal and how much of a step up from these two apartments was it? The, the, the thing was is that to really make a lot of money and I always, you know, I would try to get my hands on anything that I possibly could if I had the means to do it. I always exhausted every means I had to buying real estate. So I'd have five or six or seven properties of my own going on, like those shit boxes that I turned into gold. Or I actually, uh, a landlord who uh, eventually became like a partner to me, um, you know, uh, the, guy that, the, the guy that owned the building that I started picking the cigarette butts up for $200 a month, eventually became a partner. And then I put him into retirement with probably about, I made him about 50 million. And he said, I'm done. I want to retire. And, and that's what he's doing now. Um, so I had stuff going on with him. I had stuff going on with me. The thing is, you got to overload yourself, you know, not to the point where you can't handle it, but you got to take on a full plate. You always got to take a full plate on because you have you have different things materializing at all times. You got some properties you're fixing up. Some properties are ready to be refinanced. Some properties you want to sell because you'd rather take the money off the table and you don't want the income. You'd rather have the big picture, the big chunk of money. Uh, and then you got to do a 1031 in our country if you don't want to pay tax on it. See, the beauty of real estate is if you stay in the game like the mafia, you don't pay no tax. Well, you pay tax in the mafia, but you don't get out. That's what I mean. Uh, the way our system is set up, and I'm not trying to raise the, raise the flag here, but uh, the American capitalistic system is designed for you to succeed. You know, uh, it's the way our tax laws are. You know, I went many, many, many years without paying taxes. Donald Trump, the whole thing, he don't want to pay taxes. He didn't pay taxes. Well, of course he didn't pay taxes. He wasn't required to. 
the, the call tax laws. And if you take advantage of them, you don't pay tax. You create more business. It creates more jobs. Home Depot sells more shit. And everybody lives happily ever after. So uh, basically, I was very fortunate because I've never paid tax up until like one year ago. I had to pay like a million bucks out. Um, and it was totally legal. So, you know, that's a big benefit, too. If you stay in real estate here, you, you can you can defer the taxes. And you basically defer them until you die. <laughs> okay. Well, Ben, I think probably what's helpful here is if you maybe explain your actual real estate strategy, because I know that plays a big part on sort of what you just described there. So, you buy- Networking is a very big part of it. Networking. You know, you got to network. You got to know who's in the fucking game. Pardon my language. You got to know who's in your game. If you're in Australia or in some town, you want to know who's the person moving that real estate, no matter where you're at. You want to know who's the, the, the agents involved, who are the banks that are loaning the money on it. Um, you, you know, and I don't know about your country, but in America, you can always go to a bad neighborhood and fix something up. It's everywhere. You just got to have the desire to look for it, find it, have the balls to go in. I mean, you know, you don't want to go somewhere too dangerous, but... <clears throat> typically when you go into a, a, a fucked up place and you want to fix something up, people don't bother you anyway. So, cause you're improving the place. Uh, you know, so you go in, you fix something, you got to start. If you don't start at the bottom, you know, you got to start at the bottom, work your way up. If you have the money to start in the middle, you know, you can do the same thing, which is not a bigger level. But what's your actual strategy? Because you like to buy uh, existing properties, you fix them up and then do you sell them to then buy a bigger and better property or, are you holding some of your stock as well? You mean you mean properties, not stock, right? Yes, of course. You said stock. Okay, okay. So basically, you know, I it's a matter of what I do is I have a portfolio. The portfolio has all different mixture of batches of assets in it. We've got hotels, we've got apartment buildings, we've got shopping centers, we've got properties we just bought. It's like a machine. Some of the properties have just been bought. They're in the stages of being fixed up and uh, getting stabilized so you can see what the returns are and, and see if it makes sense to sell it to somebody else that would be happy with a low return than you will be. Or if it has a high return and it's not a pain in the ass property, it doesn't require a lot of management, then you keep it in your portfolio. And that's what I'm starting to do now is I'm taking all the the very uh, minimal management uh, required properties like Ross's, TJ Maxx's, uh, the retail, you don't get a big, you don't get a, there's no flipping them, but you get a good steady income return with no time involved. So it's like buying bonds. Um, so, and then I also have the deals that I buy that need a whole shitload of rehab. And then, uh, you know, so it's like you have a portfolio of all these properties and you're always deciding what to do with it. <coughs> but you're always buying, you're always selling, you're always refinancing and you're always fixing. So how do you, defer paying tax like okay it's real simple it's called a 1031 exchange okay see i don't, I don't want to talk you know i don't want to say things you may already know there's two types of uh tax that we have in this country we have short-term capital gains and we have long-term capital gains are you there so far mm -hmm. all right so anything under a year that you make money on you buy a stock and you sell it under a year it's short-term capital gains you're going to pay the highest tax rate, whatever your income is, uh, whatever income your bracket's in or, you know, oh, no, I'm sorry, capital gains is 20%. You're going to pay, well, you know, if it's less than a year, you're going to pay whatever your, your income is. If you're in a 35% bracket, you pay 35%. If you hold it over a year, you only pay 20%. Um, and hopefully that'll go down soon. It used to be 15%. Um, now, as long as when you sell that property that you've had for over a year, Within 45 days, you have to identify a whole bunch of properties that you might be interested in buying. And then within six months, you have to close those properties to replace with the money you had from the other deal. And you have to buy something that's equal or more than, if you sold something for a million bucks, you got to go out and buy something that's at least a million or more dollars. Right. So that's the key. And any gain and any profits that you have have to get rolled into it. Yeah. Yeah. So you can roll the profits into it and then take the money later with a refi also. But um, basically, uh, you know, you, you don't get your hands on the cash. You just keep using the cash to buy more real estate and growing more. So it's like forcing you to buy more deals and do more deals 
and, and you keep recycling all your profits into a bigger portfolio. Okay, yeah, that makes total sense. This episode of Chat with Traders podcast is sponsored by Health IQ. What if I told you that you could get lower rates on life insurance by living a health conscious lifestyle? Many people who exercise regularly don't realize they can get a special life insurance rate through Health IQ. Historically, you'd get penalized for family history, body mass index, and other attributes, but don't get rewarded for your health conscious lifestyle. But Health IQ uses science and data to get lower rates for the health conscious, those who are avid exercisers. All you have to do is take the Health IQ quiz to see how you qualify. To receive a free quote and to learn more, head to healthiq.com slash traders. That's healthiq.com slash traders. For anyone who might be sort of just getting their foot in the game of uh, fixing up properties and flips and that type of thing, what are some of the best ways which you have found to add perceived value to a property? I mean, if you're talking about, you know, small single family homes or duplexes or triplexes or, or five or 10 units, I mean, it's always best to find, if you can, not always there, the best, the, the worst dump in the best neighborhood. You know, you go to a neighborhood that's decent and try to find something that needs work. You know, it's called value add. You, you can always fix a property, but you can't change the neighborhood. You know, so, uh, or if you have the, if you can't find nothing, then you have to start selling for worse and worse neighborhoods when the prices go down cheaper. Uh, but you know, there's always something you can fix up. Believe me, there's always something out there that needs work or is distressed. Sometimes not even construction. It can be management, you know, management distressed. We don't even need to fix the place up. You can always take a hotel and, and take a, a, a uh, a no-name hotel and put a franchise on it. You know, if you have the money, you can invest in a, take a hotel. The franchise tells you what to do. You go, I, I, I own like, I don't know, at least three Marriott's. <coughs> they come in, they tell you what to do. If you got the money, of course, you got the money to do it, you do it. You got their name on it, they send you business, and uh, normally franchises are pretty successful. Because then you got help. And they only make money if you make money. Right. So, you've probably already explained this, but just if we could go into it a little further, like you started out buying these really shitty properties, you fix them up, you turn them to, to gold as you described. How did you go from this, from buying small properties or a, a couple units at a time to now buying hotels and, and full apartment blocks? Like you said, Marriott's there. Like, how did you transition? It's, it's just a matter of growing over the years. I've been doing this for, you know, I started in real estate pretty much almost like 30 years ago. So, you know, you start off with small duplexes, fourplexes. And then uh, sometimes, you know, I, I did get involved with somebody that had some money so and credit. So um, I took advantage of that opportunity knowing a guy that had a place and, and I did all the work and he just put up the money and credit. But, um, I mean, you know, you, you just keep building. Over 30 years, I went, you know, I just kept growing and the numbers get bigger. And uh, they had to go because the government wouldn't let me take the money or else they tax it. So I never, you know. But you still got credit to live off of and uh, income from the properties to live off of. So you still live a good life. I mean, you grow. Everybody grows. It's like any business. You, I know one guy, he bought a Burger King. Now he owns 20 of them. You know, you learn the business, you grow, and you try to do more and more and more. Like any other, any business, really. So, it's essentially like a compounding effect, yeah? Exactly. That's what life really is. I mean, to me, you know, if you're a person that plans on growing, you know, you're going to grow no matter what you're doing or buying or selling or whatever the hell you're doing. Just keep growing. Yeah. So, your real estate portfolio as it stands today, uh, from what I've heard on the Life for Sale series, it's somewhere around about the mark of $200 million. I mean, yeah, it depends. Yeah, roughly around there. Yeah, give or take. To what extent do you care about the current real estate cycle or general market conditions? Like, is that something that you give any thought to? I mean, the market is going to be the market. It's always going to be rotating. You know, we're going to have our ups or downs. Right now, we're in an up. How long will it stay there? Who knows? 
Uh, they're going to overbuild apartments again, and and then the tenants are going to be charging too much rent. They're going to go out and buy houses, and they're build a bunch of houses. It's a crazy cycle, but hey, no matter what, you're always making money. If you're in the business and you're looking for bargains, if you're willing to get your hands dirty and put some effort into it, and there's always money to make, you know. So it doesn't matter to me, you know, what the market's doing, really. If the market is up, I will think about selling any properties that I want. I'll seriously think about selling because that's the time you don't want to miss the boat. If you don't sell when the market's up, uh, I'm not the type to cry over spilled milk. Oh, well, I could have got another million bucks. Fuck that. I already made three or four million. I moved on. I'm happy. Uh, so if, if the market's high, you better think about selling any assets that you know you don't want to keep long term. Uh, so the market is very important. And then when the market's low, uh, you buy the shit out of everything you can. Okay. So if you are selling some of your inventory at what you think might be the top or, or when the market's quite high, in, in your situation, the way you do things, you've then got to go and buy another property, don't you? Unless you want to actually pay tax on that. Yes. Yeah. I'm net me. Yeah, right. Exactly. My, my back's up against the wall all the time. I'm constantly in 1031 clocks are ticking on me. If I don't hurry up and close a deal by June 20th, you know, I can have to pay out a lot of money in taxes. So I always have these clocks ticking, but that's part of the game. You know, nothing comes easy. You know, there's got to be, uh, you know, everything can't be perfect and easy or else it wouldn't pay off. So there's, there's plenty of rules in the game. Of course. Well, let's speak a bit about that. Like, how do you sniff out a good deal? Let's talk about how you find these deals. Networking. I'm at the point now in my life where I totally depend on brokers because they're in the business to sell real estate. Find the right brokers that are actually in the business because their life depends on them selling real estate. So, and then you get and know who the brokers are, know what they got for sale. As soon as it comes on the market, make sure you know about it. Be the first one out there to look at it. Uh, schmooze these guys and always be loyal. What keeps me better, I compete with REITs out of New York City, big shots, you know, big companies. Um, only because a small guy like me competes with them because I'm loyal to the brokers. The brokers know that I'm not going to screw them over. If I tell them I'm going to make a deal, I'm going to make a deal. I'm not going to make their life miserable. And when I go to sell that property, I'm giving them the option to sell it for me. So they get money on the front end and they get money on the back end. That's called, you know, networking, loyalty. But that's once you're in the business. You know, but you got to find the people that are in there making these deals, listing the properties, you know, they're out there advertising. and you can find LoopNet. Go on LoopNet for starters. So, are the brokers bringing you a lot of properties that are unlisted and like haven't actually gone onto the market yet? Yeah. Well, because now I've grown to that relationship with them where they say, holy shit, I know what this guy wants for this deal. I can call Ben up. Ben will buy it quick. I won't even have to waste my time taking it out to the market, going through all the hassles of showing it and all this. It's even worth uh, him taking a cut in his commission to sell it to me. So once you get really good with brokers, you know, you start getting off-market deals for the guys that want to move their properties quick. They don't want to go through the marketing process. So, you know, networking is a big part of it. You know, knowing who's in the business, who's making deals. You, you got to understand that you, you do it in a very small geographical area. You know, I mean, you know, you could do it in a large geographical area, but if, you, if, if a typical person like me, I only do it in Florida. I only got to know what's going on in Florida. I won't look at anything outside of Florida. I got my ass, I made money and got my ass kicked in Texas. Uh, you know, I'm not, I, you know, I did real well in California, but I don't want to go back there. But I only, you know, in real estate, you don't want to spread yourself too thin because I don't rely on management companies. I don't want nobody else managing my money and my business. If me and my kids can't handle it, my family can't handle it, we don't do it. Um, you know, so we can't spread ourselves too thin. That's what makes us better than everybody else. We're actually hands-on making our properties, you know, into what we want them to. We don't call management companies up or big shot contractors, you know. So that's a big part of it. I mean, if you put your time into a real estate deal, you know, you'll be successful. Exactly. So when you first came to Florida, or even if we just maybe tailor this answer to someone who is new to real estate, like how do you actually go about beginning to build domain knowledge of that area so that when a good deal comes up, you recognize it as a good deal and you know to jump on it? Like, what are some of the first steps to building good domain knowledge of the area you want to target? I mean, you, you have to know the area. 
Where's the good part? Where's the bad part? Uh, you got to know everything that's for sale as far as commercial real estate. Now, you know, real estate, when you narrow it down to your type of real estate, it's not that big. You know, you're not going to be looking at what industrial or warehouses or office buildings if you're in the apartment business. You're only going to be looking at apartments. So you narrow it down to every single property that's for sale and the type of real estate you're looking at in that area. And you see all the different people that are marketing it for sale. That shows you the whole market for apartment buildings in, say, uh, Tampa. You go on LoopNet, uh, basically I'd say CoStar, um, you know, and you, know, you go to all the big brokerage firms and look at their websites and uh, you look at every single body and what's for sale in that market and the type of product you're looking for. And the numbers got to work. You know, you got to have a plan. Either the numbers are working right now and you can make them better, you know, or the numbers really suck right now and you hope you can make them better. You got, you know, it's, no, the banks care about numbers. All the bank cares about is money in, money out. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that's actually something I wanted to ask you about. Whenever you go into a deal or you, you're considering buying a piece of real estate, What's your ideal risk to reward ratio? Like how much money do you like to put in for how much profit potential? I like to put in as little as possible. <laughs> you know, I try to get as much I can as the banks and the bank. Um, you know, typically I'm going to put in 20 to 25 percent. That's on apartments. On hotels, it's a little tougher than, you know, they want to see you start putting in maybe um, 30 to 35 percent you know, and hospitality, but, and then you got to consider how much money you need to fix it up. And, you know, and I mean, but, uh, and then you go refinance later also. So, but, uh, you know, if you can do a million dollar deal, you're going to need a quarter million bucks probably, you know, put down. Okay. And then let's say you spend, let's, let's say you need to spend a million dollars fixing a property up. How much profit would have to be in that deal for you? If I paid a million and then I'm going to spend another million fixing it up? Just as an example, yeah. I have to, that thing better be worth about, I'd have to at least make a million. Okay. At least. A million uh, purchase, a million fix up, and it should be a million profit. So, what is your due diligence process like? I mean, I, you've been doing this for 30 years now. I'm sure it's going to be very different to someone who's just getting started in this business, but What's your due diligence process like before you actually, I guess, sign on the dotted line to actually purchase? Everything. Everything. On my level, everything. The due diligence is, number one, if it's an apartment building or a hotel, you walk every single every single unit, you walk yourself. And then, then you still have somebody come in and maybe do a structural inspection, a roof inspection, make sure the plumbing's in good shape. You know, inspections are very, the money, the little money you spend on inspections gives you a peace of mind. Your due diligence is very important. You know, you got to make sure you got to, you know, the banks are going to make you do it anyway. The banks aren't stupid. They ain't going to want to get stuck with no dumpster unless, you know, unless you got certain money put aside and they know that you're going to fix it. But, uh, you know, due diligence is very important. Income, expenses, all the bills that the place is paying, you know, rent rolls, insurance costs. And I guess part of the, the art of deal making is the ability to negotiate. What tips do you have for negotiating a good deal? If you can normally not do a long due diligence is one of my, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's a trick, but, you know, it's just it makes it more inviting to the seller that when you come in, like a lot of times, I mean, I've been around the block. Uh, if it's a small deal and I walk every apartment, I might say, screw it. I'll give you a million bucks deposit tomorrow, non-refundable. And, uh, and then, you know, we'll, we'll close the deal in 30 days. I mean, um, <clears throat> luckily, you know, it, but you know, I, I don't recommend that for anybody unless they really know what the hell they're doing. You know, I, I can take that risk. I know how to look at a property. Everybody else should make sure that if they don't not sure of something, you better know. I can get on a roof or I can send my kid up on a roof or send somebody I know on a roof in five minutes and tell you if it's good or not. You know, um, so yeah, you know, showing people that you'll do a quick, clean deal and not have any contingencies on financing, that beats out all the other people that want to pay them more money but drag their ass out. And also, with the other people and those long deals, they have the opportunity to come back and retrade before the money's hard. When I come in with hard money, they know I'm not fucking around. I'm going to buy that building. 
Yeah, I mean, because you've got to, I guess, consider that the seller has holding costs for every day that property is still in their name, right? Well, you know, it shows that, you know, if I don't fucking say what I'm going to do, I'm going to lose a million bucks. Mm, yeah. He'll make a million dollars off of me and still sell a million. Hey, that's happened. I've had guys give me hard money and then walk for the fucking deal because they couldn't perform um, what they promised me they could do. I've had guys give me a couple hundred grand and say, hey, I'm going to buy your building in a month. Well, a month goes by and they didn't buy the fucking building. That deal's over. And that 200000 is mine. I hate to do that. I don't like to do that. But I will do it if you waste my time, you know, in a deal. Whatever you say in a contract is in a contract. I presume you have some pretty good lawyers too, which have helped you out? I pretty much just rely on one lawyer I've been dealing with for like 15 years out here. He's real good, work well together. But that's all he does. All he does is real estate transactions. You don't want to hire a divorce lawyer to handle any real estate transactions. You want people, you always want to hire people that specialize in your problem. Whatever the problem is, find somebody that specializes in it. It's like a real estate broker agent. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good tip, actually. Um, ben, let's uh, let's shift gears from real estate now. Let's go into, I guess, I want to hear a little bit about your, your outlook on life because I think you have an awesome attitude and mentality. So, um, just a couple like general questions to take us out here. Um, what's the best money advice you'd give to someone in their in their 20s or maybe even early 30s? I mean, I'm very partial to real estate because real estate's some kind of something you can touch. You know, you control it. You know, if it's going to go good, you're going to make it good. If it's going to go bad because you you screwed up, but, uh, you know, and you're in control. You're in the driver's seat. I mean, real estate doesn't really take up a lot of your time to where you can even do other things or you can do a lot of real estate. You know, you can rent a freaking house out, and the person pays you to rent every month. They call you if there's a problem. You send somebody over to fix it. It doesn't take up any of your time. You take the rent money. You pay your mortgage payment. You, uh, you pay your taxes and your insurance bill, and that's the end of it. It's simple. You know, you don't even need any help. You know, so I've always been, you know, leaning towards real estate because you can make money without having to really worry about it. And it's a necessity. People always need a place to live. I mean, it, it is also quite easy to lose money in real estate as well if you don't know what you're doing, right? If you pay too much, that's the problem. People pay too much. You know, you got to make sure when you buy a deal, you're buying it at less than the top dollar price other people are paying. And you can look at it by the square foot. You, the most important thing is if it's an income property, you can't lose if you know that the rent is reasonable and it's what the market is paying for rent and that's what the place is collecting. You know, if the place is collecting enough money to pay its bills, then it's pretty much a safe bet. As long as you keep collecting that money and doing everything you're supposed to to keep that money coming in, uh, you know, and then that's the risky part with houses. You lose your fucking tenant and then you're stuck. You got nobody there. With, with three or four apartments, you got the other rent still coming in. Now, different sort of question. You know, if we look back at, the life you've lived and where you've come from to where you're at now, I think it's, I mean, it, straight up, it's pretty inspiring. Um, what would you say to anyone who blames their past for where they're at in life? All right. You know, that's the one thing you can never do. You got to let the past be in the freaking past and don't even think about it unless it's some sort of benefit to you to think about it. Uh, if it's negative, forget about it. Move on. Worry about tomorrow. Worry about the future. Uh, you know, and just... Try to, uh, don't, you know, learn from those bad experiences. Every time something bad ever happened to me, it turned out to be good. I swear to God, it, it always been that way. Something bad happens, but if it wasn't for that something bad that happened, something good never would have happened. So just, you know, keep moving on and learn from your mistakes and, uh, try not to make bad decisions and try not to, you know, hang out with shady, shady people and, uh, you know, and do the best you can to grow in life. Every day, people should be growing. I mean, I've always wanted a lot of money. When I was a kid, I was poor, and I always wanted nice things, you know, because I didn't have them. So, you know, to me, it was a hunger. Everybody's got to follow their own hunger. It may not be money. For me, it was always money. Because money, you know, I just seem like everybody who had money it makes your life a lot easier. And we're not here forever. So I want my life to be as easy as I can, especially with the crazy kids I got. I need all <laughs> the money I can get to fucking help me in life. Right. 
All right, Ben. Well, let's uh, leave it at that for now. Um, I just want to say, like, I really appreciate you doing this. I've been watching the show and absolutely loving it. And I was like, it'd be awesome if I could get Ben on the podcast. I know he's not a, a trader in the tradi- traditional sense, but... Um, let's do some human trading. I'll give you Danny. What do you got for me? I'll take a fucking kangaroo even. How about this? I'll trade you Danny for a kangaroo. <laughs> Hey, kangaroos are untrainable, aren't they? <laughs> they you can't train a kangaroo like to, to bounce around the house and keep shit in his pouch for you, like cigarettes and uh, things like that, right? I'm sure someone's tried. Um, I, I don't know of anyone. <laughs> that would be, so you guys don't keep them as pets. They're too wild no, to be pets. Absolutely not. They're too intelligent to be pets. That's the thing. I think they're fucking intelligent. I'd love to see. I would pay big money to see one punch Danny in the face. <laughs> oh, my God. They punch pretty hard. My wife wants hard. to go to Australia, but I'm scared. You guys are like fucking rough out there. You got like snakes and deserts and, you know, it's really rough. But I heard from an Australian I met that there's practically no crime. Is that true? Crime is very, very, very low. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders. But rest assured, there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.